for that. Thank God that's something that doesn't change. Amen. Thank the Lord for it. Well, let's go to James chapter one again, if you would please. James in chapter number one, we'll continue in this new series. We just started last week and uh, James, short, concise book, uh, but a very powerful book uh, as uh, we're getting into it. And so looking forward to uh, what we have here tonight, calling the series a concise course, concise, sh uh, short, <clears throat> not that our series will be, but the book is, a concise course on Christian maturity. And uh, we introduced a subtitle to the series title last week, Grow Up. So that's it. Grow up. And we all need to do that, right? We all need to grow up. So tonight we're going to look at uh, verses 2 through 4. That's going to be our text. Uh, really just looked at verse 1 last week and just did the introductory work. And, and uh, kind of actually though, we, if you remember, we covered the whole book in a concise kind of way. All right, so here we are again. Verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. All right, so that right there actually tells you quite a bit. The 12 tribes, Jews, Jewish Christians, scattered abroad, tells you that they are under some form of persecution, right? They're not where they had been. They're displaced, displaced, scattered abroad. And it could refer to those that maybe were there on the day of Pentecost, were saved, and then they went back home. So I realize it's that, but as we get into it, you'll see that there certainly is a lot of duress that's on these believers, whichever circumstance that they're in. So then, verse 2, he begins, gets right into it. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now, I believe that verse 4 is a key verse. It really is. All right, so let's go back and just read verses 2 through 4. It's a short read, uh, but there's a lot in here, okay? So, um, put yourself in their place, perhaps. You've been displaced. You're living on the island of Cyprus or you're living in Antioch or you're in Asia Minor somewhere and you've tried to get away from problems and now problems have followed you where you are. And he writes, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. Does that make you scratch your head just a second? Count it all joy? Uh, James, <laughs> um, man, how do you do that? Well, verse three, knowing this, that the trying, uh, that the trying of your faith worketh what? Patience. Patience. Okay, but it doesn't end there. And, but let, but let, he says, but let patience have her what? Perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. All right, so here's the title of the message tonight. The road to maturity is uphill the whole way. <laughs> the road to maturity is uphill the whole way. All right, so may God bless the reading of his word and the application of it. Pray God will really use the message here tonight. Be an encouragement and a help to every one of us. <clears throat> the road to maturity is uphill the whole way. Well, I imagine everybody here nearly, if not all, has heard at one time in your life someone probably older than you say, hey, look, when I went to school, I mean, you know what's coming next, right? When I was in school, well, I walked to school uphill both ways. Uphill, but in a foot of snow. I, uh, I determined that when I got older, I wasn't going to say things like that. But, you know, you get older and you actually end up saying something <laughs> like that. Because I've caught myself saying, you know, when I was a kid and I rode the bus, we had to walk this far even after I got off the bus. Yeah. So there, right? 
So what, what is, what's going on there? Uh, well, that's one generation who's been through some hard times who ought to be appreciated. Saying to a younger generation, grow up. <laughs> be tough. Hey, life's not easy. It's not easy. So a little bit of background. I mean, one particular quote that I'm going to share with you now says this, and it, it really led into the title of tonight's message. So I want to give credit where credit is due. Um, a gentleman by the last name of um, Motyer said this, Christians are special people. <laughs> you say, wait, wait a minute, how do you mean that? All right, you know, <laughs> don't read too much into it. Christians are special people, but not a protected people. Christians are special people, but not a protected people. Indeed, there is a sense in which they ought to expect even more than their share of the buffetings of this life. Christians are special people, but they're not a protected people. In other words, we're not free from the trials of this life. In fact, if we're thinking right, we should actually expect to receive more. You say, I didn't know that when I signed up to be a Christian. Well, <laughs> Uh, if you're a Christian, you're saved by the grace of God, and that same grace that saved you can sustain you. Yeah. But I think he's right, right on to something. This is because, he goes on, patient endurance of all sorts of tribulations is God's appointed way forward for his people towards maturity. The tribulations of life are God's appointed way for his people to the maturity and crown that he wills for them. Ask James, the writer says, ask James. And this is where I actually got the quote or the, the title of the message. Ask James, does the road wind upward all the way? And hear him say yes to the very end. The road of the Christian life winds upward to the very end. And he goes on to say that that teaching by, that James did is no different than the teaching of any other writer of the Bible. Paul would agree. Peter would agree that it's through manifold temptations that we grow and we mature. Um, Paul would say our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us an exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So, I mean, really, they all match up. Uh, but he went on to say this um, at the end of this quote. He said, but this is different than those teachers of modern days that try to find an easy way to holiness. Well, you need to settle on your heart and mind tonight that if you are going to be a mature Christian, there is not an alternate route. There's not. There is not an alternate route. Route. Mature believers equals many trials. Now, that's not the whole equation. I want to give the equation here at the end. This is the, the text. Our text use a little, uses a, um, a mathematical term, so we'll get to that in just a moment. But I, I thought about it this way. Mature believers equals many trials. All right, look around the congregation here tonight. Uh, there are many that have walked with God. I was trying to think, where do you put this uh, number here? Do we, do we say if you've been a Christian for 50 years, you're a mature Christian, um, 40 years, etc.? I mean, really, how do you quantify that, right? I mean, truly, if, in fact, if you're a mature Christian, you're saying, um, actually, I'm not. I still have a lot of growing to do, right? But, but let, me, let me toss this out here, okay, just for our consideration. Um, in fact, let me just ask, let me, let me just do this. If you've been a Christian and you've been in church over 20 years, would you stand? Okay. You're, you're a Christian. You've been in church over 20 years, over 20 years. You've been in church and a Christian. Okay. Uh, there's some students standing up and, and depending on when you got saved and that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I'm looking around tonight and, uh, there's some mature believers in here. There's some evidence that there's some believers that have been through some trials in here. You, you wouldn't be in church for 20 years or more 
if God hadn't helped you, number one. Would all of you agree with that? You would have given up a long time ago. But God, God has helped you in the midst of your trials. It's not like you've gotten to where you are now as a, and, 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 by the way, this is not saying, okay, here are the mature believers. <laughs> right? That's not it. But I, I, I'm trying to make a point. The believers that are standing up right now, uh, especially those that are older, because you probably didn't, thir- okay, if you've, been, if you've been in church, let me, let me narrow the numbers down here a little bit. <laughs> if you've been in church over 30 years, would you keep standing? If you've been in church over 40 years, would you keep standing? If you've been in church over 50 years, would you keep standing? All right, yeah, wow, some of you are really old. (laughs) Sorry, that's not my point. (laughs) Would you agree with me? You've been in church over 50 years. Has there been quite a few trials that's come your way? Younger generation, would you look around and see the people that you ought to model your life after here for a little bit? Thank you. you. You all may be seated. I was going to ask how many of you would say if you've been tempted to quit along those years, sit down. And I imagine all of you probably would have sat down, right? If you've been tempted to, because life's hard. It really is. I'm so glad God's brought us to the book of James as a church. I think it's at a critical time. It fits our theme, uh, you know, teach them. Because really, you know, here we are going to have our business meeting tonight. We'll go over a financial report. It's a strong financial report. We'll do the election of officers. Uh, there's godly men that, and ladies alike that are, on that, that are on that ballot. But the future of our church depends on the maturity of the believers of this church. Which means that there needs to be another generation that's coming up. And I thank God, that by the grace of God, I think that that's happening. But if that's going to continue to happen there's got to be believers who are going to say, I'm going to, by the grace of God, I'm going to be faithful come what may. Amen. Your Christian maturity will determine your stability. Your stability will determine your service. Those go hand in hand. If you're not stable, you won't keep serving. Unless you're just stubborn. Stubborn. I think it takes more than that to stay in church a good long time. And the goal, by the way, is not just staying in church a good long time. The goal is Christ-likeness. That's the goal. But we all agreed last week that maturity is not automatic. You can grow old but not grow up. You're only young once, an individual said, but you can stay and mature indefinitely. That's why Paul said, flee also youthful lusts. Because you can stay juvenile in your mind, but it's time to get over junior high. Right? I mean, you think about it, whenever there's workers that are needed or, um, well, let me just say it this way, on the ballot tonight, there's not any babies on the ballot. Physically speaking. And there's not any spiritually speaking either for that matter. Sorry. <laughs> Couldn't have implied the wrong thing. <laughs> no, there's not even a list of babies that are newborns. Why? They don't have the maturity to uh, show up and count the offerings for the finance committee. We don't have any toddlers that are on the ballots tonight. Can you imagine? <laughs> we, we have elected four-year-olds to go in there and count. Oh, my soul, what's going to happen there? That is not good. No, there are adult men on the ballot. And there are adult women that will be clerks and so forth. I'm just simply saying when there's a need for the church to move forward, you call on the mature, which all believers need to be. By the way, hey, by the way, those of you that are sitting up here on the front row, some of these young men, I love it that the, some of these young men sit up here on the front row. Uh, that, that's fantastic, isn't it? Because you don't have to be 20-something to be mature. You can be 10 and be more mature than a 20-something-year-old. Actually, I think some of you are more mature than some of the 20-year-olds that I know. And I'm not making any eye contact with any 20-year-olds at this time, but... You see, age doesn't determine maturity. It does not. 
And so we agreed last week that maturity is the need of the hour. Warren Wiersbe said, too many churches are playpens for babies instead of workshops for adults. So there needs to be a growing up. And so James identified the need uh, for mature believers, and he does so throughout the whole book. I mean, it really is the overall governing theme. So he not only identifies the need for that, but right out of the gate, he identifies the way to maturity, but it may not be what you'd like. Well, okay, let's just all be honest. It's not what we would choose because it has to do with trials and difficulties. And I'm rather allergic to pain. I like life easy. I like comfort. I like things going smooth. I, I like health. I like, I like uh, you know, just things going well. But listen, when is it that you grow the most? Is it not when you're going through some tough times? I mean, really, even if we were talking about weightlifting, which obviously I don't have a clue about that, but, but if, if you talk about weightlifting, it's that, it's that breaking down of the muscle to build it again, and that's how you grow and develop. Well, well, that's the same way that we grow spiritually, is that the trials of life have got to put pressure on us, and you grow through that. These believers were scattered abroad. They were forced out of their homes. They were a displaced people. And, and you know, being displaced... For any length of time has its own set of difficulties that come. Isn't that right? I mean, you know, maybe if you're out of your home due to, uh, you know, maybe you had some problem at the house, you had to live somewhere else. That's so inconvenient. But these, these were out of place because they'd been run out of their homes. There was persecution that was spreading. We saw that last week as you read the book of Acts, chapter 11, 12, and 13. You're reading about these people. So... They had double trouble in a sense, in the sense that they were Jews in Gentile areas. Well, the, the persecution of the Jews and the hatred towards the Jews is a modern phenomenon as well. But it go, traces all the way back. I mean, the Jews have been hated for many, many years. So they were hated by the Jews, Gentiles, because they were Jews. But watch this. Not only were they Jews, but they were Christian Jews. So they were not only hated by the Gentile pagans that were around there, but they also were hated by their own countrymen. The Jews hated the Jewish Christians. And so they were, they were discriminated against in, the, in terms of, uh, of the uh, uh, businesses and people wouldn't sell to them or they wouldn't buy from them and so they lost money just because they were Christians. So life is hard, period, because we live in a fallen world, but it's even harder for a believer. Well, in the midst of all that, in the midst of trials, if I could apply it to us here tonight, because there's a good host of people that are going through a real trial, and my heart was just um, was stirred even in, in the preparation of this message because I thought about the many families of this very church that right now are going through some really, really deep waters. But they're deep waters that even other believers that I just saw stood a moment ago, they went through some of those deep waters maybe 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago, even further back. So I want to say to those of you that are going through those, with God's help, you can get through that. And God knows, but it, but it can be very disillusioning, I think. And can, it can be rather discouraging. And, and, and because of this, I think it's very true, and it, it cannot be bypassed, that your faith, our faith, will be tested. It will be tested. Either you are, and you've heard this before, but it still stands true. You are either right now in the midst of a trying time, or you're coming out of one, or you're about to go into one. Until you get to heaven, that's going to be life. <laughs> you're, going to, you're either in a trying time, or sorry, you just can't, let's do it sequentially. You just came out of one, enjoy the moment. Because you're going back into another one. I do my best to try to be encouraging to you on Wednesday nights. <laughs> that's just true though, isn't it? We can't, we can't really find another route. That's one thing I really want everybody here to see because it's so tempting just to say, I'm done with this. This is too hard. This is too difficult. And, and I want to be sensitive tonight because I understand that there can be some real uh, heavy hearts in here that maybe are due to, the, uh, to different circumstances that I'm not necessarily going to go into right now. I might, I might later, but, 
but I, I've got a few quotes, and if they were a help to me, I feel like they could be a help to you. And so maybe your trial is just getting through the quotes. I don't know. I don't want it to be that way, but, but I, I believe this could be a help to you. But, but listen to this when it, this gentleman said, we say, that believe, we, we say that we believe that God is our Father, but as long as we remain untested on the point of our belief, our belief rather falls short of conviction. Someone else said it this way, that if a, if a faith can't be tested, it can't be trusted. So this individual goes on to say, but the days come, the day comes as it does and will when circumstances seem to mock our creed. Circumstances seem to mock our creed. Wait, wait, don't get lost in the words right there. All he's simply saying is that sometimes things happen that cause us that even mock what we believe to be true about God. I think, isn't it true that way with Job, even as we had the book of Job study? Boy, I sure enjoyed that. And, 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 but it was true that he wrestled with this. And so sometimes your circumstances can mock what you believe or your creed. When the cruelty of life, he goes on, denies the fatherliness of God or his silence sometimes. Sometimes, dear church and dear individual here tonight, sometimes it seems that God is silent and, and his silence calls into question his almightiness. Isn't that true? And then, and then he says this, and the sheer haphazard, meaningless jumble of events challenges the possibility of a creator's ordering hand. And in other words, it seems like things are so chaotic. Is God really in control of all this? I think we all have been there. Because some of the most perplexing situations of life is wondering why is this happening to believers? James, right out of the, right out of the, uh, well, just I mean, the first bit of ink that he puts on the letter is is to say, my brother, count it all joy when you come to diverse temptations, when you fall into diverse temptations. I mean, given what they were going through, it's no wonder that he just cuts right to the point, isn't it? In fact, all the other topics that we're going to cover are some, in some way related to what we're talking about even tonight. I mean, this is, you can tell this is what's on his heart and mind because he knows it's what's on their heart and mind. I want to remind you tonight that the way that we respond determines how you grow spiritually. Notice if you would in verse 2, 3, and 4, just look at the verbs. Look at the verbs Count, count it, knowing, verse 3. I may not hit, be hitting all the verbs, but if you want to know how to get through the trials, this is what you got to do. Just look at the verbs. Count it all joy. Know that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And then let, here's another main verb, verse 4, let. And then we're not going to cover it tonight, but we will in a coming week. Ask. Are you in a trial tonight? Difficulties set in and pressing on you. Here's four verbs that'll help you if you understand them. And that's what we're going to work into here. Count, know, let, ask. Okay, so let's look at it. The first term that we come to is the, word, the verb count. Count it all joy. It is a, ca- a counting term. So how do you add all this up? <laughs> how do you add all this up? I mean, you, you add it all up. And, and here's, you know, I mean, I got this going on and then there's this difficulty and then there's this person. Come on, everybody in here has got that person. I'm not saying it's all the same person, but I'm saying you got that person. Okay, so you got this going on and then you add to that this and then there's this financial shortcoming and then there's this health situation and then there's that person and then there's that situation at work and there's that situation there and you add all this up and you're supposed to add that and put it in the column of joy? Bless you. <laughs> on top of that, sickness. <laughs> I mean, really, what is, what is God's equation on trials? How does this equation work? If a moment ago, um, pastor said that mature believers equals many trials, there must be something else to that equation because there are many trials that have come 
And yet, some are not in church or not serving God anymore. And thus, we could even say this and with, with um, caution, but we would say some immaturity was there evidently, or they didn't let, okay, let me, let me say it this way, just to use the terms of the passage. They, didn't let, they did not let patience have its perfect work. Is that fair? I've had times like that. I imagine you have as well. If we keep living, then we certainly will into the future as well. But, but it, it is true, given what James is saying, that many trials equals mature believers, but there's something, there's another part of the equation that we need to, to work to. So he says here, count it all joy. So let me just hasten to get to it here. Count means consider, think, add up, uh, account. It's the word from which obviously we get accounting. And so he says, count it all joy. Consider it. Let me just, that's easy, isn't it? Consider it all joy. Is he being insensitive? Uh, well, obviously not. The Holy Spirit of God is leading this, so James is not being insensitive. It can kind of come across that way. And I'm not, even, I'm not even advising that right now, you know, you have somebody that's just going through a major trial, just go up to him and say, hey, count it all joy. All things work together for good. I mean, those are true statements, but maybe right then it might just be good to do like the friends of Job did and just go and be quiet for a while. And they should have stayed quiet and just left and said, hey, we're praying for you. That would have been good. Okay, but James here is speaking with authority. He's the pastor. He cares about them. They're scattered abroad. They're going through trials. And he says to them, listen, I, I want you to think about it this way. I want you to consider it from this angle. I want you to add it up this way. Yes, you've got many trials. We want you to be mature believers. So your many trials plus what? And, and so we're, we're building up to that. But he says, count it all joy. All joy. What, what does that mean? Well, um, all joy. Count it. Is, is he saying that everything that happens, you ought to find joy in that? Well, no, I don't think that's what he's saying at all. Um, because that would be kind of twisted thinking. Man, I'm glad I lost my job. This is awesome. Okay, that, that's, <laughs> that's not what he's saying. <laughs> like, I mean, that, that's, that's just ludicrous. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes you see people like that. Oh, man, <laughs> I lost my job. This is great. Okay, they're fake. That's not real. Come on now, you lost your job. Okay, so it can't be that. So... I think the idea here, and I, I would agree with a man named Douglas Moo who said this, that, that the all there it can have several different meanings. It goes way beyond what time we have to get into tonight. But it, but it basically means this, in terms of intensity or completeness, it's unalloyed, it's pure. Count it all joy. Count it pure joy. That, that kind of captures the idea. Uh, count it genuine, there it is, genuine joy. Okay, you say, well, I'm still struggling even with that. Because how can I count my trials that I fell into as a source of genuine joy? Well, it, it, you can. It can be a source of genuine joy if you think about the rest of it. Okay? So, in fact, there's, there's a, a common phrase of this that is in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18, where he's writing in a different context where he says to those that are servants under masters to be under their authority with all fear. All fear is same same terminology, all fear. But in other words, what he's saying there is be genuine in your reverence towards your master with all fear. So here it is in this context, brother, my brethren, uh, count it all joy, all joy, count it genuine joy when you fall into diverse temptations. So what are you saying, preacher? I'm just simply saying that you can have true, genuine joy in the midst of life's difficulties. Remember when we went through the book of Philippians and one man defined joy as the flag that flies above the castle indicating that the king is on the throne? That's my favorite definition of joy. By the way, joy is a fruit of the Spirit. So to apply that to James, you've got to be walking in the Spirit to have joy in the midst of your circumstances because he's not, he didn't say, count it all happiness. No, happiness is about your happenings. The happening here is not producing a lot of happiness. No, but you can have joy if you think about the rest of it. 
Okay, count it all joy, he says, genuine joy. In fact, uh, one man said it this way, James encouraged them to embrace their trials, not for what they were, but what God could accomplish through them. Do you feel the difference there? Okay, let me run that by you one more time. As he said, James encouraged them to embrace their trials, not for what they were, but what, for what God could accomplish through them. He's not suggesting that we wouldn't be saddened by these difficulties. I mean, we have folks here who have just lost a a spouse or a father or a mother or or some life-altering set of circumstances. There's going to be sorrow in those circumstances. There's going to be uh, difficulty in those circumstances. It would not be true to life not to have that type of sorrow. But, hey, listen, like Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, he said, We sorrow, but not as others who have no hope. So he says, count it all joy. So to count it all joy then, and it has to do with the way that we think about it, then, then we, need, we need some clarity on this. We need a bigger vantage point than just the way that we're looking at it in the immediate. And sometimes you just, you need somebody to tell you, hey, with God's help, it's going to be all right. There's a bigger picture at work here than what you're seeing in this little bit. Okay, I, I um, kind of been struggling about where to fit this illustration in here, and it's not a big illustration, but last night we were turning out of a ball game, and we were in Shawnee, and, and uh, I, was, uh, I was driving, and, and it, the road there, had, Highway 18, had gone from a four-lane road down to a two-lane road. It was right there at this place where we were, the boys were playing ball, and, but now there's, there, it's dark, it's out in the country, there's no, there's no lights I turned out, but then it, it scared me. I thought, oh no, this is a four lane highway. And I just turned on that road and I saw a car coming. I thought, ah! <laughs> Actually, it was a two lane road and I was just fine. And Trevor said, Dad, what are you doing? Because I was turning it around. <laughs> I wasn't thinking clearly, it, it was dark. It had gone from a four-lane road, which would have been bad had I turned, if it had been, four, are you following what I'm It could have been bad. But then I realized, oh, wait, it's not as bad as I thought because it was the right way to go. Okay, look, I'm just simply using that to say there's sometimes when trials hit you and you're in the dark about those trials and you can't hardly see, you don't know which way to go. Are you following what I'm saying right here? And it can be overwhelming and sometimes you just need somebody to ask you, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> it's all right, you're doing right. You're going the right direction. Okay. Okay, let's go to the text again. We're almost through verse 2. Are we doing all right? My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. Fall. It's only used three times. This word fall is only used three times in the New Testament, this particular uh, verb here. It's used in uh, Luke chapter 10 when the man going down from Jerusalem to Jericho fell among thieves. Remember that? He fell among them and and they beat him up. And, And then it's also used how in Acts 27, how the ship ran aground. It ran into the reef. So that's that kind of pictures how this is. He says, count it all joy. Well, that doesn't make sense. Count it all joy when life beats you up. Count it all joy when you run into a difficulty. That wouldn't make sense in and of itself. But when we step back and we see the bigger picture that James is trying to help them to see, then it makes sense why you would count it all joy. But that's the word fall. I'm just simply saying to you that there are times that that, uh, the circumstances of life hit you out of nowhere. You're doing exactly what you ought to be doing, serving God, and out of nowhere a trial or difficulty can come. Just because something bad has happened to you does not mean that you're in sin. Now, when something happens, it's a good time for everybody here to stop and think, have I done anything that would bring God's chasing? That's a very legitimate question. But it would be like Job's friends to say, well, this is going on in your life because you must have secret sin. That's not true. You may be exactly where you ought to be be, doing exactly what you ought to be doing, and out of nowhere, a child can hit you. I remember... uh, being at camp and at, at Camp Canaan in the Somerset, Kentucky area, and 
and I was playing shortstop. It had been a long time since I'd played any softball, and so I, I grounded the ball, and I got set, and I began to throw, but the ball sailed on me. You ever had a ball sail on you? And it just kept going up. Like, no, 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 sit down, sit down, you know, and, but it went over the first baseman's, you know, and he tried to jump and catch it, but it went over his head and over his hand, and it bounced one time, and everybody said, watch out, and there was the volleyball court right behind the softball field. And a little girl in the seventh grade watched out. She turned around at just the right time, one bounce, and boom. <laughs> hit her right in the nose. Fortunately, she was fine. And we took a picture together of the, uh, with the softball later. I was there preaching to her. It was a great moment. She'll never forget it. I guarantee it. Yeah. Watch this. She was where she was supposed to be, doing what she was supposed to be doing, and out of nowhere, a trial came. Okay, now that one's comical, right? But it is true, isn't it? That you can be exactly where you ought to be, doing exactly what God wants you to be doing, and out of nowhere, a trial can come your way. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall on the diver's temptations. Divers just simply means diverse, different kinds. There's all kinds of trials that can come. Temptations, the word temptation could be a, a little confusing. It is used in some context where it's like the temptation to sin, but here's just a test. The context determines how the word is used. So he's not saying when you got temptation to sin. No, that's not at all what he's saying. He's talking about the trials that have come. So, but this, this testing is interesting because the idea of that testing in other contexts is that it has a purging effect in your life. A purifying effect. I want to remind you tonight that our God is a refiner, not an arsonist. There are pyros in this world, and some of them are in this auditorium. People that just like to play with fire, but our God does not play with fire. Our God is a refiner that removes the impurities, that also does this, proves the genuineness the genuineness of that metal. In fact, refined gold is of greater value than raw. Some of you are in the fire right now. It feels like the heat is turning up. But God hasn't forgotten you, friend. How can, you, how can you say, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations? And you're not going to believe how fast these next two verses are going to go. Extremely slow. Verse 3. Here's, here's how you can consider it. Genuine joy is because of what you know. Not because of what you feel. He did not say... Count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. Feeling this. He didn't. He didn't say wishing this, hoping this. He, he didn't say experiencing this. No, he said this, knowing this. God has not called us to be understanders. God has called us to be believers. And there's going to be many times that we will not understand. I can't understand. I can't wrap my brain around some of the circumstances that are out here in our congregation. I can't understand that, whether it's a child or whether it's an adult or a teenager. Hey, I, I can't understand that. But God has not called us to be understanders. He's called us to be believers. And we can't count it all joy when we fall or he overcomes us, these dire temptations, because of what we know. See, here's the equation. Many trials plus Bible truth applied equals mature believers. That's it. Many trials, they're going to come. You can't stop them, friend. They're going to come. But many trials plus Bible truth, but not just Bible truth and not just Bible truth known even, but Bible truth applied. When applied, it can help you stand strong in the seasons of life when in other circumstances without God, it would have just blown you away. But I know who my, my Redeemer liveth. Amen. And I know that he's with me. And these great Bible truths can help you to stand in the most fierce of circumstances. And you know this to be true, that God is in control. And he can use this, even though I wouldn't choose this route. But the path of Christian maturity is uphill the whole way. And he can help me grow. Amen. Knowing this, 
Here's what do you know? Well, look at it again in verse 3. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. The word patience is so interesting. It's made up of two words, which means to remain under. In fact, I love the song that, that, uh, that we had during the offertory as Brother Ken and Miss Sarah played that, abide with me. It's the same word, abide. It, it means to abide under. But here it is, abiding under that difficulty. Patience, it's not just like, I'm going to passively surrender to this. No, but it's courageous perseverance. Knowing that the trying of your faith works endurance, patience. Wow. What an interesting word. It shows up in Romans 5 that tribulation worketh patience. Same word. The same word also shows up in Hebrews chapter 12. Let us run with patience or endurance. Let's bear up under this. And again, it's with the grace of God. Understand that. It's based on what you know. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh. Okay, the word work there means this. It produces. It um, results in. Okay, or, or is everybody still following along here? Please endure to the end of the message. Okay, because the trying of your faith works patience or endurance. And so then verse four, he says this caution, but let patience have her perfect or complete or entire work that ye may be perfect. Another word, mature. As I'm going through this trial and I'm, knowing what God has said, and I know that the trying of this faith, as difficult as it may be, the trying of this faith works endurance so that I might continue serving God, but I need to let patience have her perfect work. I don't need to get cynical. I don't need to get bitter. I don't need to give up. I don't need to stop on God. I don't need to stop on church. I need to keep going. I can only keep going with the help of God. And that's why verse five says, ask God for help. Ask God for wisdom. You can't make it on your own. That's very true. We'll come to that God willing next week. But he's saying right here, listen, here's the equation. There will be many trials, but as you apply Bible truth, then God will give great growth. And thus, we can respond with genuine joy when trials come because we know they are God's way of helping us grow. It's not my way, and it's not your way. We choose an easier way. To see some going through the grief they're going through, to see some of the caregivers of our church right now, there's a lot of them but I'm watching them grow through it. You know, even, even while I was working on this sermon, and I'm, I'm, believe it or not, I'm near the end. While I'm working on this very sermon, some of the prayer cards that were in the commentaries that I use, one of them was a missionary whose wife is experiencing some health concerns. Another was a missionary has adopted a child. That's a trial in that child's life. It's a trial in that family's life, the process of adopting. But they've grown through it. The child adopted has grown through it. In addition to that, on my prayer list is the names of some of the adults in this room who have concern over an adult child that has strayed from the Lord a car accident, a sickness, an extra busy work schedule, and the list goes on. In other words, it's true. Many trials have come and will come. And the remote road to maturity is uphill the whole way. And while you may not choose that course, you'd like to have an alternate route. I want to encourage you tonight, like James did, to have courage and take courage in the fact that God is with you 
and His grace is sufficient for you. And by responding to this, you grow and you bring glory to God. And there's a bigger picture that you and I can't see right now. In fact, from our vantage point, it looks pretty messy at times. You ever watch somebody weaving a tapestry? On that back side of the tapestry, just all those strings just look like a mangled mess. But on the other side of it, it's a beautiful picture. Many trials, plus Bible truths applied, equals mature Christians who, by the grace of God, keep standing. And God gets glory for it. Father, tonight, thank you for not leaving us alone without a word in the trial. And I don't know to whom I'm speaking completely tonight. I don't know all the circumstances <clears throat> that may have crowded in around someone. But I know, dear God, based on what you've said here, that they can have real, genuine Joy, not in the circumstance itself, but in you and that you're at work. The text certainly does indicate <clears throat> that you work patience through that <clears throat> growth, spiritual maturity. And maybe, dear God, tonight some just need to let patience have her perfect work and it may take some time. And so I just pray that you would help where help is needed. In Jesus' name.